Hey, greetings. Welcome to the Brain Gauge channel. Uh, got an interesting question uh, about feed forward inhibition the other day. And basically the question was, can the brain cause diabetes? And I think it's probably sort of a chicken and egg uh, question, but let's, uh, let's take a look at what we know. And just as a quick review, what's about feed forward inhibition? What exactly is it? And one way that we measure it is, is really the easiest way to describe what feed forward inhibition is. And keep in mind that we, if we do it, what we call a static threshold test, where we deliver a really small uh, stimulus and try to figure out what's the smallest stimulus someone can feel, uh, we get a bunch of values for different age groups. And you can see that's what's in blue is static threshold. That's a minimum stimulus that you can perceive that you can feel on the skin and you know obviously it's going up for age and that's because skin physiology degrades with age so that's that's nothing new everybody in the world's published this so it's not a real big deal dynamic threshold on the other hand is is slightly different from static threshold and you can tell it starts out very very small where you can't feel it and it and the stimulus grows up until you can perceive it. That value is much larger than the static value. And basically this is a result of sub-threshold conditioning. So when you're delivering a sub-threshold stimulus over here, this is a sub-threshold conditioning stimulus. So this is smaller than you can perceive and you deliver that long enough before what happens is you basically are conditioning uh, the brain so that it can no longer detect the stimulus. So as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it no longer, that is no longer the threshold. The threshold is much bigger. So the, it requires a much larger stimulus to feel because you're conditioning everything. You're conditioning the brain, you know, to not feel it. So this is higher. The dynamic threshold is higher than the static. And the result of that sub-threshold conditioning is really due to what we call feed forward inhibition. And that's what that feed forward inhibition is, or that's where it comes from, is the difference between these, these two thresholds. So let's look a little closer about what's going on in the brain. Uh, in the brain, what's going on is when you get input to you know, that sub-threshold that's not turning on the excitatory neuron, like in other words, if you deliver a large stimulus, this excitatory neuron is gonna fire. If you deliver a small stimulus, it's going to turn it, smaller stimuli that are subthreshold will turn on inhibitory neurons, and those inhibitory neurons will turn off or just lower the threshold of the excitatory neuron. So you can see with each subsequent stimulus that's subthreshold, you get a lowering of the threshold of the excitatory neuron, and it, basically that's kind of interesting, but you say, well, what application does it have? And we found that uh, people with autism and people with chronic pain have lower than normal feed forward inhibition. In other words, when you do the sub-threshold conditioning, it has a lot smaller effect on, on the uh, threshold. So basically that means the feed forward inhibition is much lower than normal. And you know, so we we're trying to understand what is what is the root cause of this, and it turns out that the neurogliaform cell plays a huge role in it. The neurogliaform cell is NGF, written over here. It has a huge role in in this uh, feed forward inhibition that mediates it through GABA B. Uh, well, one thing about the neurogliaform cell is it also produces insulin. So if we want to get a little bit more understanding of what's going on with uh, with that feed forward inhibition metric, uh, we study, we just determined let's study a population that might have some bearing on that. And if this is producing insulin, maybe we'll get a different effect with uh, diabetics. And it turns out with early stage diabetes or people who didn't even have peripheral neuropathy at the time, um, that was very early on, uh, in, in, in their stage of diabetes, uh, they actually have double the normal of 
feed forward inhibition. So that's kind of fascinating. I mean, they've got twice the amount of feed forward inhibition as normal, not the twice as amount as autism and chronic pain, but twice the amount of normal. And that's really impressive. So that gave us some ideas about, well, what's going on? Maybe, maybe, uh, you know, just think about it. If, if the gliaform cells are producing, um, if they're hyperactive to the extent that feed forward inhibition is higher than normal, and they're also hyperactive in the fact they're probably producing more insulin than normal, then, you know, they are probably producing uh, insulin and uh, all over the brain. And because again, they are trying to compensate for the lower than normal uh, conditions of, of inhibition. So, you know, what are these lower than normal conditions? They could be caused by uh, things like lower than normal GABA A, and GABA B is compensating. So there's hyperactive neurogliaform cells. But overall, if you think about it, if there's more insulin in the brain, there's going to be a feedback loop to the pancreas to turn down insulin. And as insulin gets turned down in the pancreas, then maybe, uh, you know, those lower than normal insulin levels will lead to higher than normal insulin levels being produced by the NGF cells in the brain. And so that's called the maladaptation loop. Or that's what we call it anyway. It's maladaptive because it's not good. And, it, you know, basically the brain is going to protect itself by producing enough insulin that it needs. And by the way, uh, there are places in the brain people have found 10 times as much insulin uh, as you find in the bloodstream. So this recursive loop could be uh, part of the problem with diabetes. And of course, it hadn't been proven, but it's just a thought. But here's another thought. There's a lot of disorders like uh, anxiety and stress and depression that are treated with GABA agonists. And in particular, um, well, both GABA A and GABA B agonists. But if they're treated with that, then that means you have lower than normal GABA. But if you continue to have, say, stress and anxiety, or depression and lower than normal GABA, and it's not treated, then maybe uh, what happens is the neurogliaform cells try to compensate and they try to not only produce more GABA, but as they become hyperactive and uh, obviously their feed forward inhibition is higher and uh, they become hyperactive both in GABA B activity as well as, as insulin production. So that could be why there's a high comorbidity of diabetes with chronic anxiety and stress and depression. And that, you know, there's also a high, higher than normal, I think it's 17 or 20% comorbidity between diabetes and Alzheimer's. Just something to think about. But anyway, just think in terms of the big picture is that if the brain is producing insulin, you know, because of some neurological disorder, uh, or the neuro or you have a neurological disorder because of too much insulin in the brain, uh, and insulin being turned down and you have a diabetic condition, either way, it's a chicken and egg thing. As I said before, you have this balance or this trade-off, um, either way, it's something to think about and just think, well, diabetes is probably not a good thing. So, uh, what are the scores that you want to look at? Well, we mentioned before, researchers generally the only people that actually measure the feed forward inhibition metric directly, but feed forward inhibition plays a role in a lot of different things. And it's not the only thing that's impacted by uh, diabetes, for example. When diabetes gets severe, speed is impacted. And there are other things, other contributing factors. A lot of people know that if you have significant obesity, it can lead to diabetes. Uh, obesity makes things like accuracy and timing perception actually very poor. Uh, timing perception is actually very poor in diabetes, but not that poor in early, early stage diabetes. Plasticity is going to be impacted, obviously. Feed forward inhibition metric plays a role in a lot of things. So, uh, but it's integrated mostly with accuracy and plasticity.
and, and directly with sensitivity if you actually take that score. So hopefully that that either, that, <laughs> if that doesn't cause too many more questions, feel free to fire me another one and I'll try to answer it. But uh, thanks for watching.